Hey guys, what's up? Stock Retail coming back to you. Um, Want to talk today about something I'm seeing all over Twitter, YouTube, Reddit, etc. And it's just all this discussion of what happens when uh, AMC sells shares into the market. So I'm sure you saw yesterday we were all talking about the 8K that got filed. So the AMC team filed the reverse split, the settlement and the conversion paperwork that shows us kind of what's happening, when that's happening, how that's happening. Uh, if you didn't catch, I did a video on that yesterday, or I'm sure there's lots of other apes who've done some great DD on that. Uh, check that out. In that filing, we saw that the team, um, now they have access to sell a whole lot of shares over the years, but for now, they, they filed that they want, are going to basically hold in their pocket 25 million post-reverse split shares that they'll sell from time to time at the market. Uh, before I go further in this uh, discussion today, let's just highlight that language. From time to time means they're not dumping it all at once. You know, there's a lot of people on Twitter that I'm seeing who are kind of saying, um, you know, what happens if we wake up in the morning and there's 25 million shares that just got sold? Um, well, they already said that's not how they're doing it. And not to mention Adam himself has said multiple times uh, in interviews that he, and actually on earnings calls, that he would kind of sell shares into the market sort of wisely and at a certain pace to manage price action. Uh, and we're going to talk today about um, his past track record at doing that and how has the team done. So we're going to cover that, but just really want to make sure we saw in that filing, the language was at the market. That also um, heads off another bit of FUD, which is people saying, oh, he's just going to hand this to the hedge funds and whatever. There's different ways of selling shares for a company and placing them on the market and increasing your float. Um, and at the market means they're basically selling them into the market. Now, it's facilitated. There's partners, all that. But you don't just hand them to your buddies. That's not how at the market works. And then that from time to time piece means it's not just dumping all at once. But also I want to talk about what would happen when AMC sells shares and has that happened before and what did that look like before? So let's go into that. First, let's talk about, um, you know, there is a track record, there is a history here of selling shares into the market. And actually, if you don't know, it's very closely connected to our June 2021. You know, some people call that the sneeze. Some people might call it a squeeze where we ran. You can see here from the beginning of April, uh, which just was a date where I could get some squeeze information. Uh, sorry. Yeah, squeeze information. Um, short information, all those, you know, the kind of metrics we're going to look at. Um, from that moment in time, on a uh, post-split basis, so kind of, you know, we're looking at AMC since APE has been created. We ran from a price of $6.20 on AMC to $44.61. That was a 620% increase, um, or basically, you know, it went 7x uh, from where it was. So those are pretty reasonable numbers uh, in terms of making sense to us today, right? We closed today at about 368, I think. After hours, I saw we're up a little bit. I'm filming this during after hours. You know, I think you guys have heard I'm on the West Coast. It's 4.30 my time right now. After hours will close in about a half an hour. Um, you know, a, a price of 620, we've seen that recently. That's not some kind of wild price. And so I want to just ground us in, you know, Shorty likes to say you're never going to get there. I remember at this time... Uh, I was getting, actually like in March before that, I was getting um, kind of, I don't know what to call it, harassed, trolled, attacked by shorts constantly saying, you'll never get back to, at that time they were saying $10. Well, we ran to, if I forget, if I ignore kind of the split that we've had, we ran to $72. And I remember it just, you know, three months before that. So we ran in June, in March of 2021, I could go back and find if, as long as Shorty hasn't deleted their replies to me, um, multiple times where, in fact, I took screenshots, so I know I've got it, where they were saying, oh, you'll never even get to 10 again, and then we ran to 72. Or what I'm showing you here is, is not that run to 72 because I'm showing the split adjusted price. But imagine going from 6 to 45 almost. That'd feel pretty good, right? Well, let's look at the conditions in which we did that and what are the conditions today um, and what was the involvement of Adam and team selling shares? We're going to tie all of this together so you can understand then, understand now, and be able to answer that sort of FUD narrative of kind of what happens if all the shorts buy up all these shares and they cover. All right. So 
in 2021, in that run, on April 6th, you can go kind of check this. My sources today are going to be Ortex and Fintel. You can go find this. Quick search on Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it, you'll find this. It's I'm sure you can search other places too. Uh, so in early April, our short interest was 15% or 76 million shares. As of this morning, I think, uh, our short interest is 28%, 144 million shares. So you can see on AMC, we've basically doubled the amount of short interest. Kind of wild. Both from a percent and a shares standpoint. That change in short interest from that 15% to this 28%, that's an 87% increase. So that's that almost doubled, almost 100% increase uh, in short interest. I will show you here with Ape too. Um, oops, we lost some animation. I'll, uh, hopefully at the end of this slide, I'm gonna be able to show you. If not, I know that that number, um, if you look at Ape short plus AMC short, it's like 225 million shares. Uh, I'm not going to go back and fix this slide. I do these videos in one take, and this is, I'll just tip my hand here a little bit. This is already the second time I'm recording this one because I had a, another mistake I made. So I'm just going to keep going. But with Ape, I want to say it's over, it's like 225 million shares are short, and it's like, I don't know, 16 or, I think it's 17% short or something like that. Um, so we're still above what we were in 2021, in, both in terms of shares and then in terms of percent. All right, how about cost to borrow? That is certainly a metric for squeeziness, let's say, because if you are burning cash on the short side, eventually you don't love that and you want to get out. Uh, in April 2021, we were at a 10% cost to borrow and a 39%, uh, it was a 10% average and a 39% max. Look at this now. As of today, I'm sure you guys have seen this. We're at 825% average cost to borrow and over a thousand percent on the max, that is an increase of 8,000 percent on the average and an increase of uh, like 2,500 uh, percent on the max. On the daily box office, so let's just look at, um, generally you would feel comfortable holding a short for a company that's failing, right? Um, and you wouldn't maybe mind that cost to borrow if you thought you were about to hit a home run. But let's look at sort of uh, how is our industry doing and therefore kind of how is our company doing well the daily box office in this time period in 2021 was 8.9 million dollars in the domestic box office right now we're averaging this is um oh what's today august uh man guys my brain's all over the place august 15th uh, so we're basically 45 days of the quarter. So through 45 days of this quarter, we're averaging about $42 million a day. That's a 370%, or you could kind of say almost a 4X, 370% uh, increase. So it's almost 4X what we were the last squeeze. So obviously our business is way, way, way healthier. But you know that because we just had profits in Q2. Uh, concessions, another obviously big part of the business, in uh, this time period in 2021. So I'm gonna look at Q2 versus Q2. Q2 of 21, concessions uh, revenue was 162 million. We just finished Q2 of 23 at 488 million. So that's 3X, it's a 200% increase. So the business is way healthier, the shorts are higher, and the shorts are paying more. Starting to sound pretty squeezy, right? All right, debt back then, was 5.2 billion, so the short thesis would have been, I'm shorting this company because they can't manage their debt. Our debt in it now, is, as of the close of Q2, is 4.8 billion, so we've reduced debt by $400 million, or almost 8%. How about liquidity in the marketplace? Are shorts going to be able to hold their position? Are they gonna be able to stay liquid? Uh, back then we had a mega bull market, right? Everything was up, stonks go up, you could throw a dart at a stock and probably make money back then. It is not the same market now. If you look at the IMF, if you look at the fact that the Fed's been tapering, if you look at interest rates, look at some of the banks that were going under and having to be rescued, we are in a time of liquidity risk. And there are quite a few larger, um, let's say, financial accounts and analysts who are very concerned about liquidity in the market. Uh, I know the cash... If you look at kind of just how much cash is floating out there, that has also gone down. So liquidity is far, far worse now than it was when we squeezed. That puts pressure on the shorts, by the way. 
It's not so much pressure on AMC because you can see I've just demonstrated AMC's liquidity has improved by a ton. But our opponent's liquidity, our detractors, those who want us to go down, they're facing a tightening market. How about days to cover? That is a really key metric. If you don't know much about days to cover, this DTC line, you need to research that if you're in this for a squeeze because you need to understand what days to cover might mean if shorts start to cover. Uh, back then, it was two days to cover. It's basically a metric that just says, hey, at the kind of recent average volumes of the stock, uh, in theory, how many days would it take shorts to cover at those volumes? But understand it's a big deal because it, if shorts were really covering all that volume, that's a heck of a lot of buying and would be a real problem for them. And the higher that goes, the riskier it is for them. Well, we were at two when, again, remember, we ran basically to $72 or that post split adjusted 44-ish, 45-ish. We are now at 7.7 .7 days. That is a 267% increase or an increase of 5.6 days, almost three times the days to cover than it was back then. So you can just hear very, very squeezy right now. Um, remember all of this because we're going to come back to this. Uh, just kind of otherwise, there's a lot more visibility. Um, there's a lot of, you know, kind of how many times have we trended all over social media, all of the education, all of the awareness that's gone on. Um, just a little squeezier now, in my opinion. Uh, all right, here's that animation. Yay. So there's that 225 million I told you about if you were to include Ape, because we know it's about to convert, right? So next week, we're going to see one float. And so that's why I want to just take a view of that one float. What is the total short? Uh, that is that 15%. So as a percent, we're really kind of back where we were uh, in 2021, but a ton more shares shorted with a much better business. So I'm still saying, hey, that's an increase. By the way, I'm looking at just the share short, not the shares on loan. If you look at shares on loan, it's actually significantly higher for a lot of these um, squeeze metrics. Cost of borrow is just way, way, way higher than back then. You know what, I'm going to skip forward. You get it. We're way more squeezy now than we were then on every single one of these metrics. So what did happen in 2021 before the squeeze? Let's take a look. If you didn't know, in May, so that same time period, I just showed you a bunch of April metrics. So really, you can use either one. Look at April's float. This is how many shares were outstanding. This is the float. So in April 2021 or in May, there was these 450 million. Notice that, you know, we ran in June. We ran like June 3rd-ish or June 2nd and June 3rd, something like that. It was like right after Memorial Weekend. Um, notice that 50 million shares got sold to the market. That's interesting. 50 million shares got sold to the market in 2021 and we squeezed. And I wouldn't, many people kind of call it a gamma squeeze, not even a short squeeze. It was a squeeze though. Think about that for a second. I'm going to repeat that again. When we had less squeezy metrics, lower shorts, lower cost to borrow, lower days to cover, a worse business, higher debt, and a bull market with plenty of liquidity. We sold into the market 50 million shares and we ran 620%. That was 11% shares that were added. Um, and there were that was 50 million shares that got sold in. Remember I just showed you there were 76 million shorts. We almost sold as many shares as there were shorts. Does that kind of start to match some of what you're hearing about now? Uh, and do you think they were covered? Because they didn't. I can tell you right now, they didn't cover back then. And if they had, forget running to 72, we would have bonkers run who knows how high. Um, so I'm going to make something up here. All right. So now we're talking kind of what if scenario modeling. We're not talking DD. Oh, well, it is DD because what if can be DD, right? You got to understand what might happen to my stock if, if some things play out. So I just kind of looked, um, if you sold 11% again of the combined float, it would be about 17 million shares. Well, what did Adam file? They filed, we had 25 million shares that they're going to sell from time to time. So I'm going to just look at if they dumped 17 million of them, kind of like this 50 million dump back then. So that you're hearing, that's kind of the same thing. They sold 11% more of the float. I'm going to look at what would happen right now if they sold 11% more of the float after the reverse split. So the first thing, though, we need to understand a concept. Let's look at kind of market action. So kind of on a normal day, you've got your buys and sells. I'm looking at the top left here. 
the market makers are kind of reading what's happening. There's a lot of uh, sophisticated software that's running um, AI algorithms, all the things, which is where we believe that there's a lot of manipulation, right? But there is some market making that's based on supply and demand. So there's all these little buys and sells that are happening, right? And market makers are kind of pairing that up and finding them together. But what if, I guess I said 25 million shares here because that's the talking point out there. But, you know, let's talk 25, 17, whatever you want to call it. There's this huge sell all of a sudden, right? That's that at the market. They're selling in more shares. And there's where you hear dilution from the Gasparinos of the world and the shorts and all of that. I just talked about in my last video this notion of value creation. But let's even set that aside for a second. Let's just look at market making. If you want to, let's, let's say for a minute that the shorts... Um, and the trolls and the shills are right that there's this talking point of what happens if all the shorts cover with those 25 million shares that is a huge 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 amount of buying okay yes there's dilution but if you put 25 million shares into the market post reverse split and there's tw immediately 25 million shares of buying demand for that to cover Remember, that's those 25, they'll kind of cancel each other out. All these other little buys and sells, that's still happening. Retail hasn't gone anywhere. We're still here. Us apes, we're still buying. If Adam was to put 25 million post-reverse split shares on the market and there was an immediate 25 million share demand to cover shorts, please understand the price would go absolutely parabolic like nothing you've ever seen before. So just kill that FUD in your mind because the amount of buying demand that the market makers and their algorithms and all of that would see would be insane like nothing you've ever seen yet okay and i you know you could try to say that's not how it works but let me go back i just showed you sorry for all the animation let's just skip all this do 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 do, do. sorry if you're hearing this in the mic we had a you know a 7x run with far less squeeziness with 11% of shares getting sold in to the market in an at the mar at the market program i'm just telling you and that was without shorts covering if you go back and look at how many shorts there were pre that run and how many after a lot of us don't really believe very many shorts covered at all and you can also look at the age of shorts. That's another metric I should have shown you. You can look at the age of shorts and kind of figure out there's still a lot of shorts that exist, I believe, even from before January of 2021. So we've had this before without a bunch of short buying. If you were to layer in doing the same thing with a better business, worse market conditions for the shorts, and short covering, Guys, you can kill that line of FUD really, really easy. We would go absolutely bonkers, parabolic, and crazy all-time highs. Some of this is opinion. Do some research. Do your own deed, DD. But this is basically how it would work um, in terms of covering and gobbling up those shares. The way the market makers work, the way the algorithms work, the way the price discovery works, it would show this insane demand that you've never seen before. All right. Let's talk a little bit about dilution versus value creation. It all connects back to all of this that we're still talking about. It's kind of this, um, what if they sold in those 17 million, that sort of 11% that we did in 2021? What if it happened again now? First, I want to ground you in a metric. Um, we're not going deep on this. I'm just going to kind of blast by it. But I'm showing you here a screenshot of Cinemark's, um, some of their metrics. You can, just, you can see I just pulled this up on Webull on my phone. Webull is not my broker. They're a pay for order flow broker, but uh, I do just kind of track a lot of things because it's easy on my phone. So just using them for the app. You can see that Cinemark's, I've circled this, they're forward price to earnings. So price to earnings is take the market cap of a company. So basically the sum of all of its uh, you know, stock price times how many shares there are. Um, you can see, and then you divide by their earnings. In this case, it's a forward look at earnings because they haven't been profitable sort of backwards, but Wall Street is, is forecasting. There is a forward view here that is pricing in. What this really means is 17 years of earnings in their current price. So at Cinemark's current price, if 
for the next year, what, what everybody kind of thinks they're going to make in terms of profits, they are they priced in 17 years worth of earnings. I had said on the last um, video I made that in our industry, price to earnings tends to be between 15 and 20 years. So I'm just proving to you that I'm not making stuff up. You can see, you know, here is a competitor in our industry, very similar, not just, it is the same basically company, uh, just without, you know, just different fundamentals, different support, uh, Cinemark more institutionally owned, uh, AMC more retail owned. But in our industry, just proving to you, hey, it's normal to price in, in this case, 17 years of earnings. That's going to matter because we're going to go through an example here. If we drop, now let's set aside for a second this idea of the shorts gobbling up all the shares the second they hit the market in order to cover. Guys, we want that. People are trying to freak you out like, oh no, what if the shorts cover? Yeah, if the shorts cover, that's called a short squeeze. We run. I want that. Um, but let's set that aside for a minute and completely ignore that and just even say, all right, let's say that doesn't happen. And Adam just sells shares into the market. Are we going down or are we going up? What's going to happen? So I mentioned, you know, you get trolled on dilution. But now we need to think about the other side of dilution. Dilution is you're selling shares and you're getting cash for it, right? Well, what are you doing with that cash is the next part of the equation that the shorts don't like you to think about. So let's go through an example of what could happen. Now, first, I told you in the last video, eight out of the last 10 quarters, AMC has paid off debt at 33 to 50% discounts. So for this math on this slide, I'm going to use a 35% discount. But there's been quite a few that have been a little more than that. Pardon me, I'm going to take a drink of uh, my pop real quick here. That's that classic too, right? What do you say pop? Do you say soda? Do you say Coke? Kind of depends on where you're from. But all right. So let's say we sold those 17 million shares. I'm just using that example of, all right, in 2021, before a squeeze, uh, we sold 11% basically of the float. 11% of our combined float is 17-ish. So we're saying, hey, we did this in 2021 so that I'm grounding you in the fact that I'm not using hopium. I'm actually using something that's happened before. Um, what if we sold 11% again? Let's just have something similar. Um, what if we sold those at 35 bucks post reverse split? So today, really the close would have been more like $37 post reverse split. So I'm using something somewhat conservative here. Um, that would be $595 million that the company would generate. <clears throat> I'm going to talk more in a minute, but I want to just highlight, if you think to another difference, in 2021, we were selling shares in order to get debt. Basically, we were just getting debt. Um, now, uh, and I guess I'm oversimplifying there, but in, in effect, I kind of look at it like that. I'm selling shares to at least survive debt, finance debt, uh, service debt. Now you'd be selling shares to do something else with it and generate value, but we'll talk more about that in a minute. All right, so you get this $595 million, and then if you paid off debt at that 35% discount, so you've got this almost $600 million of cash, so how much debt would you pay off? Well, that would pay off $915 million of debt. So right there, right off the bat, you've added $320 million of value to the company. That's just the difference. So you, you diluted basically these you know $595 million worth of shares, but you paid off debt um, a lot more than that. You paid off $320 million more of debt. But that's not all. I mentioned to you yesterday, you know, um, that debt that you pay off comes with uh, debt payments, right? Interest payments. So if you used, I used 11% again here, no relationship to that 11% from our um, dilution. This is because if you look at all their debt, there's a lot of like 10%, 12%, 14%. Um, there's a little bit like 9%. There's even a little bit like 7%. But roughly, it kind of averages in the zone of like 11%. So that's why I'm using that number. Um, and so what would the interest payments be? So you'd save $101 million a year on interest payments. That goes straight to the bottom line, guys. So imagine if this last quarter, um, you know, we had a net income of $8.6 million. Um, imagine, so divide this number by four here to get to quarterly. So imagine if you could have added another $25 plus million plus to earnings. So we would have you know, basically kind of quadrupled or, you know, gone up by another 300% on earnings. Instead of 8.6, it would have been 
what is that, like 33, it would have been almost 34 million that we would have had. So that's why I'm saying kind of quadruple your earnings from this last call if you had paid off this interest <clears throat> and didn't have those interest payments. And then I just showed you that Cinemark, so that, that goes straight to earnings. So Cinemark has this price to earnings of 16 years, really 17 years. So I'm gonna go even more conservative and say 16 years. So if you priced that earnings in, this is what Wall Street does. All right, this is AMC's improvement to their earnings yearly. Price in 16 years, I just showed you that that's what's happening with Cinemark right now. That'd be $1.6 billion that would basically get added to the stock. So these two lines, this $320 million kind of um, return on your investment immediately, plus the value of these 16 years of cash flow that goes straight to your earnings, that adds, um, well, we're going to get to that actually in a second, but it basically adds $2 billion to the stock. And let's look at what that would end up doing. So your dilution... Um, I kind of just threw this around in a spreadsheet, figured out if you just kept your market cap, um, sorry, the it's a little bit cut off here, but it says assuming no change in your market cap. So if you had, if you had those $35 a share and you had today's float, it gives you kind of a market cap. So you're kind of hearing the math that I'm using. Then if you add these 17 million shares um, and you reduce you basically reduce by uh, not quite five bucks a share, this 480 a share. So that's the dilution, dilution, guys yelling at you. You know, you go down by more than 10% um, your stock if you just diluted. But you don't just dilute, you create value. So that value creation I just started talking about a minute ago is that 1.93 billion. And with your float plus your new 17 million shares, you would add $10.55 to the stock. So you're actually going to go up, right? The stock goes up because the value you've created is bigger than the amount of dilution you did. This is where I referenced a, a video from Warren Buffett where he tried to explain that exact same thing to his shareholders many years ago. It's a pretty old video. And he basically said, listen, if you believe in me as a business leader, let me dilute because I'll create so much value that I'll make your stock go up. I'm showing you that with math. And I'm showing you that with stuff that's happened recently. Again, all I said is, what if they paid off debt at a 35% discount and remove those interest payments? I'm using the actual interest that they're paying now, and I'm using the bottom, bottom end of the discounts he's gotten eight out of the last 10 quarters. No one can say this is hopium. Um, so that stock price impact overall, so you would have had this minus 479 from dilution, but a plus 1055 from value creation. You're up 577 a share, which is actually up. 12%. I know that might sound crazy. I want you to really go research dilution versus value creation. And I want you to research what happens when good business managers use dilution to drive value in their company. And in this case, it's kind of a no-brainer. We just talked about banks that, have been, uh, that are in crisis and need cash. That's why they've been offering this discount and are going to continue to offer this discount. Um, I, you know, sorry for the shameless plug, but go see a video that I did called The Pieces. It's got like a chess piece on the front of the, you know, like image. I talk about, you know, what it means to own a gold mine right now, what it means to have access to capital when banks are flailing, what it means for the business to be improving right now, and how all the chess pieces are set up perfectly for us right now. What I'm showing you here is not, a, yes, it's a made up scenario, but it's also based on what's been happening. So even setting aside this, well, what happens if, you know, the shorts cover and the fact that, frankly, if the shorts cover, we go parabolic, um, even saying no shorts cover, we just sell into the market, and even saying we sell in all these 17 million shares all at once, I'm demonstrating for you how he could use that to actually make your stock go up, even though there's dilution. So in summary... 2021 was far less squeezy than now. That was our run to 72 or this adjusted, you know, for the split run to kind of 44, 45. In that time, there were 11% of shares that were added, diluted, and that fueled price action. This is what Adam has tried to tell you. He kind of understands how to put shares into the market and fuel some price action. To basically, if the market makers see demand for those shares, that helps us. Um, now, with far improved fundamentals, you could be selling shares to not just fuel price action or short covering, but actually adding value 
on the balance sheet and on your income statement. In 2021, it was really more used for debt. Far different. Everything to me feels a whole lot stronger now than then. If shorts really were to buy up 25 million in shares, guys, we would just rock it. I have no concerns about that. I don't mind if they do that. And then as for like, if he sells, shorts can buy. Guys, how many short shares are there now versus how many uh, total shares exist? You know, I just told you it's 28% of the AMC float. Guess what that means? There's 72% of the AMC float that's not shorted. Add those two up, the amount of shares that are out there far, 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 far exceed shorts. They could buy right now. The shares are there. So when Shorty tries to tell you, well, if he shares uh, sells, then the shorts are going to cover, they're trying to get you to forget. The shorts could cover now. There's plenty of shares. But I'm not selling them my shares, and neither are you, and they're going to have to figure out how to cover. So just shut down the FUD, all right? Last thing, then we're done. Keep grounding yourself in reality. This on the left is our AMC debt over time. You can fact check me on this, pull up all of the quarterly earnings. It's in those reports. I've taken this straight from AMC's SEC filings. This is those last 10 quarters that I keep talking about. And on the right, this is by week, the domestic box office versus last year. Debt going down, business going up. That is a company I'm excited to be invested in. Let's go.